Okay. Thank you so much for being with us, Dwight Hopkins. Um, it's a real honour to have you with us. Um, we, we heard from Anthony Reddy last week, and he, he recommended you for the series, the Black Theology series. And he said, he mentioned that you, um, you learnt from James Cone, um, that he was one of your tutors or professors at one point. Um, he's, of course, I don't know how you describe him, but maybe as the, the, the father or the, the, the godfather of black theology, wrote some of the first books on black theology. Um, so I wonder if you could just explain um, or describe a little bit more about what you do, about um, who you are, about your background, just to start us off. Good, good. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on here, Ruth. It's a pleasure and an honor to be included this side of the pond. And uh, again, shout out, kudos to Professor Anthony Reddy, who uh, probably uses the biggest massive hyperbole and exaggeration I've met in many generations. Uh, but to return the, uh, the uh, you know, the kudos, he actually now, that is Professor Anthony Reddy, is probably the world's leading black liberation theologian on the global scale, partly because of the books he's published, but also because he's the founder and editor of the Black Theology and International Journal. And that has reached into Asia Pacific. So that platform and his own voice, critical voice and compassionate voice have all made him, in my estimation, uh, without exaggeration, the publicly recognized leading global black liberation theologian. Some of us may be leading in our context, but um, um, so glad to work on any project that he's involved in. And again, thank you. Um, I am, I go back, our family goes back several generations. So we have to start there. Uh, as all of us know, theology is primarily autobiography. All theology is primarily autobiography. And so, um, my, uh, I was born in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I'm a baby boomer. But um, our Hopkins generation in, in Virginia goes back maybe eight or nine generations. So we've been here a very long time. <laughs> so um, my uh, father's, my father's, my mother's, my father's father's father, my great grandfather, my mother's father's father, with great grandfather, were both in slaves. They were both slaves in Virginia. And so we, so that was in the 1800s. And then the oral tradition and the story, the, the family stories go back to the late 1700s. So our, my sense of being rooted in this country, in this land, and this family goes very deep. And we represent a lot of uh, Black Americans who have that same sensibility, particularly from the South, Southern part of the United States. And maybe those stories don't reach the public, um, you know, storytelling, but uh, we go back way, way. And so my both great grandfathers, when they came out of slavery, 1865, uh, they both bought land and they couldn't read or write, but uh, they bought land. Says something about me that all the degrees I have, how much land do I own, right? But it's an amazing story because my story is not, I don't think it's the exception about Black Americans, particularly in the South. That's our story. That's our story. It's woundedness, several generations, go back to slavery. And so they uh, were very much focused on getting land, um, helping local communities, uh, taking care of families, that type of narrative. And then their sons, which would eventually be my grandfathers, both grandfathers, they also bought land and they were businessmen. Um, in the South. So one generation removed from slavery. My uh, father's father would have been the first born out of slavery. He bought acres and acres of land. He owned five different businesses. And this is in the rural South, right? And um, late, eight, eight, late 1890s, early uh, 1900s. My father was born in 1907. So it goes back and back. And my mother's father, so too, he was first born out of slavery and he bought acres of land. And I spent the summers on his farm growing up in Virginia, rural Virginia. And he had two farms. He had a commercial farm, tobacco. He sold tobacco on the open market. And he also had a big farm where all the grandsons and granddaughters would come every summer and run around and like wolves, <laughs> you know, hanging out. Uh, 
And then my father, my mother met and they moved to the urban area. So that's a story I think is, in, is important to, in the mix of stories. There's lots of stories about black people, Af people of African descent in North America, but there is a story that a lot of us, particularly those from the Southern United States, when we get together, we talk a lot about those stories, you know. Um, and just that story may not come out as much. And so um, I grew up, I'm the youngest, in the family, uh, my father and my parents had eight children, six boys and two girls. So I'm the sixth son and the eighth child. And our, we grew up, our emphasis is on, first of all, family, second of all, uh, education, and third, church, in that order. <laughs> and but both my parents are deeply involved in the Black church, uh, Southern Baptist Church, small at Southern. And uh, my father was a, a, um, uh, an usher in the church, and uh, my mother taught Bible study. But my father was ushering the church and he also entertained the pastor every Thursday. So every Thursday, the pastor of the church would come to his house and sit there and have coffee. And I was the youngest, so I would just be hanging around listening. And I didn't realize until later on how important that was to have the pastor come meet with a, lay, a layman, a lay person. Uh, so all I'm saying is that both my parents, Dick and my father were involved in the church. But he taught us a lot about common sense wisdom and folk tales and, uh, you know, rhymes and riddles. And we sort of grew up with that type of wisdom in the household, in addition to and incorporated with and woven in and out of the Black church experience. I was deeply involved in Black Baptist Church. You know, I was in the Baptist Training Union. I was in the Cub Scouts. I was in the Boy Scouts, almost the Eagle Scouts. So I was, you know, all American solid kid through the church. So then my father wanted me to have, so we all, education, like I said, family, education, and church. And so he always made sure we all had a good education, given the resources he had under segregation. And so I, I was the last child, so he wanted me to have a better education. So he sent me to a boarding school. So I went to a boarding school in Massachusetts uh, from the second to the sixth form. Your British audience probably knows that. Americans have no idea, but it's the eighth to the 12th grade for us here. Uh, all boys boarding school and, um, then from there, I went on to Harvard University. Uh, so when I graduated from Harvard, I was going to go into graduate school, but I felt that I needed to, to give back uh, at least a year to inner city urban America, particularly African Americans and Brown as well. So I, I and a classmate of mine, a schoolmate of mine, we moved to Harlem, New York, and it was the old Harlem. This is a prostitution, you know, we lived, we lived, we just, you know, you're young, you can do anything. We live in the so-called ghetto, right? You know, you wake up in the night, 110 degrees in August, covered in roaches. There's no, that's, you know, the elevator, the lift is not working, uh, no cert. And so the old, old, not the one now, now they have Disney World there on 125th yeah. Street. And, and, you know, it's not, you know, that's their thing, more power to them. But I always want to set the context because a lot of folks don't know about the old Harlem. If you read the autobiography of Malcolm X, that's the Harlem we were at. Mm -hmm. The old, old Harlem, you know, gangsters and food and music and dancing and you know, it's nowadays they have no idea, do they? With the roaches all over them. <laughs> yeah, the old Harlem, right? So, uh, from Harvard to roaches, okay. So, uh, so the one year actually turned into two to three to four to five because each year I kept saying, you know, I can't leave these folks. They, you know, I can help them. You know, I can, I know how to go downtown. A lot of people had never gone downtown, you know, to negotiate. Uh, we were involved in, you know, police brutality incidents. We were involved in organized community back then. We were involved in making sure people got their welfare checks. We were involved in domestic violence disputes. I mean, we were the old school organizers. We don't, we didn't appear on public public cable. We were lived there day in and day out. So one year turned to five, and then the fifth year in the summer, in the beginning of August, when I was in Harlem. My friend, my classmate, uh, knew I had a deep religious and spiritual sensibility and always had a yearning. Uh, wasn't not necessarily to be a pastor or run a church or anything like that. In fact, we, we had left the church because we thought the church was a sellout. Uh, a lot of us in our generation, um, African-American young folks. Mm -hmm. Hence, we went to Harlem in or direct organizing. But anyhow, the fifth summer I was there in Harlem, in the heart of Harlem. Uh, my classmate, my schoolmate who came with me, he handed me a two and a half page Xerox back to back. Um, we had used Xerox back then uh, article. And, you know, I sort of read it. It said something about uh, black theology or something. You know, then I put it away. And about two weeks later, I took it out. 
and um, I still have it. And that was 1981. I still have it. it the color is goldenrod. It was mm -hmm. goldenrod paper back to back. And I looked at it, and I was like, this guy, black guy with a big afro, and it's uh, something about black theology or a seminary and justice. Uh, and the title of the essay is White, The White Left Must Deal with Racism. That was the title of the essay. Um, and I still have it here. Um, so I was like, oh man, this is interesting. Wow. I said, let me just call this guy up, you know? And I called him up and we have to set the context, particularly for academics in the United States, particularly professors who teach at research institutions. The summer is when you disappear because that's when you get your three months to work and you work. So, you know, I was like, this guy's not gonna be there, you know? And I called in this audience, he picked up. He said, hello, this is James Cohn. I was like, oh. Professor Cohn, how, how are you? you know? <laughs> he was actually there. And uh, he said, you have some next some time next couple of days? I said, uh, yeah, I'll be there the day after tomorrow. He said, well, come on. And, I can't, and so this is how the spirit in the universe works. I had been living in Harlem for like five years, and I was literally two and a half blocks from Union Seminary and never had been in that seminary and didn't know it was a seminary because back then it was, it was, it was, Border, not border, but it was closed, and you had to come in around the back. But there were no flat. Now it's beautiful. Serene Jones is the president. They've they've opened it up, new doors, beautiful entry with flags and colors. But back then, I don't know if Britain you have this concept of an armory. That's where the National Guard and all the military. They're in all the urban areas, but they look like closed tombs. The buildings, two or three blocks around, and so it looked like an armory. Uh, so and I went up, and um, so basically I went up the hill. And I went across Teachers College, oh, Columbia right. University, and there was Union Seminary, two and a half blocks where I've been. You know, who would have thunk it? Yeah. And so we went up to his room. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing. And he was in Brown Tower on the sixth floor. I still remember. I went up there and uh, we met. He has big, he has Afro. And so we talked like four or five hours, just on and on and on. And so uh, at the end of about four or five hours, uh, Dr. Cohn said, Well, uh, you go down. You go down to the second floor, and talk to Barney Bonnie Roseboro. She's in charge of the Masters of Divinity admissions, and you tell her right now that you are starting in the MDiv program. And I was like, "Okay, <laughs> did I come here to go to school?" And that's how, what happened. I went downstairs on the second floor. I talked to the Reverend Dr. Bonnie Roseboro. She admitted me into the MDiv program, and the rest is history. Wow. So James Cohn himself was happened. very approachable. And um, I didn't have, because school started in a month, this is August, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't have any scholarship, anything. I had to take out loans. I had to work. But I went to graduate school for one. Oh, gosh, yeah. He's the terms of humor and jokes and trickster. And, uh, you know, he has a public performance, you know, white people and all. But, you know, on a personal scale, you know, he, he'll... We're losing you. We've lost you a bit. Are you there? No, oh, I'm sorry. I think it's not my end because I'm actually down here. Um, I guess you can cut and paste. Mm -hmm. But uh, Dr. Cohen, as we were saying, is was very, very personable and very passionate and compassionate about his students and poor people. I mean, he helped a lot of people with loans to buy their first homes. His PhD students. He helped when you know marital disputes. A lot of that doesn't. You don't hear about that unless you knew him as a doctoral student. You know, uh, I can testify he's helped me. He helped me in my early life and other students as well, other parts of the country, in fact, globally, because he had a lot of students from Asia, Africa, Pacific Island, Latin America. Um, so that's what happened. I had never heard of a seminary. I thought, it, I thought the article was spelling cemetery. It was actually <laughs> seminary. <laughs> never been to Union, never heard of seminary. I, was a, I would have thrown a rock at a church at that age. You know, I was like, no, because there's, there's a whole generation of black folks who left the black church uh, in the 50s and 60s, um, partic well, particularly 60s, uh, when it came to a peak, because a lot of us felt that it was not engaged in the day to day survival of poor people and people who were on the margins of America, the people who were promised opportunities but were denied those opportunities for whatever reason. And so a lot of young folks said, well, look, we're going to do our own thing. And that's actually how the Black Power Movement uh, 
uh, arose in 1966 because that generation of people uh, had left the church, not necessarily Christianity, but had left the black church. As you probably know in the audience, it's probably a literate audience that's, that's listening to your program, the black power movement was started by Stokely Carmichael, who was the head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So SNCC, SNPC, SNCC was the youth arm of the Martin Luther King movement, the old black preachers. So that's what we're saying. Black power came out where people who were nonviolent, part of the liber black civil rights movement, the Negro. And so it, it, it that's what, so that, that the fact that Stokely and his generation moved out of, you know, civil rights into black power is an example of the point I'm making. And those of us who weren't national leaders, I was in high school, I was in boarding school, you know, and uh, we still were following things. A lot of us said, well, you know, we're going to go, we're young people, we're going to change the world. So let's just do our own thing. Um, now, I wanted to clarify, so that's my journey, my relationship to Cone, but it's part of a larger narrative of how we get to Black liberation theology. Stokely Carmichael, who's the chairperson of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, mm -hmm. which started off as the youth wing of the civil rights movement, which we know was led by Dr. King and the Black preachers. Quiet as it's kept, Rosa Parks, a Black woman, actually started it. And the Black women actually started the boycott. That's the real history. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, but we, would, we don't want to disparse the past as they did. You know, King was killed, so he, gave, he sacrificed. But we don't want to forget how important and Black women were uh, involved. Um, so the youth wing grew, and they were not organizationally, but, lit, but still part of the civil rights movement. Uh, in June, on June, uh, June 16th, 1966, in a march, a civil rights march in Mississippi, actually specifically Greenwood, Mississippi, June 16th, 1966, there was a march co-led by Dr. King. He was at the head of the march, and next to his, on his right side, was Stokely Carmichael, who hit the youth wing. And the, uh, a lot of national and international press were at this march in Mississippi, June 16th, 1966. They asked King, he's co-ed, what does he think? So I still believe in nonviolence and integration. And they talked to Carmichael. He said, no, I don't believe in that. And then he went on to talk about, we need black power. That's when black power took off, specifically on that date, that occasion, and that particular young man. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of national, international press, so it became globalized in the media of that day, right? Not like yeah. Twitter and all that. But, um, and a lot of black people who were professionals and even everyday people had to respond to this new development. What is black power? Is it the armed struggle? Is it terrorism? Is it communism? Is it radicalism? Is it uncivilized? Who are these young people talking about? So what happens to civil rights and King? And one of the group of uh, black people who had to respond to the cry for black power, that is respond to it and interpret it, were a group of black pastors. Mm -hmm. And June 16th, black power rises in the United States. July 31st, 1966, 42 black pastors signed a black power statement and they published it in the New York Times. So this was unbelievable. So technically, black liberation theology begins July 31st, 1966. Cone writes his first book, Black Theology and Black Power, in March 1969. But those of us who know Black Liberation Theology at USA know that Cone comes out of a movement three years prior to his arrival on the scene. And he would tell that, he would say it too. But of course, everybody, he is the father of, uh, and I guess for younger people now, he would be the godfather of Black Liberation Theology. The original definition, this is very important for today's movement in the United States. The original definition of black power, which was enunciated and shouted on the Civil Rights March, July, June 16, 1966, by Stokely Carmichael, the head of the youth wing, was for black workers, rural workers, to own their own land. That was the content then, before the intellectuals like me got in and started writing hundreds of books. But the original was, it was in a movement from below, outside of the church, outside of the academy. Uh, it was for black rural peasants to own the land. So it was an economic movement. And, it, and they also, and Stokely and, and the young folks said, 
also the black rural peasants and workers should occupy all the political offices where they are majority population. This is what black power was in the US. That's before cable news and Hopkins started writing books and Cohen. Uh, that has been, always been an impulse. So the question of economics and politics at a grassroots level has, has, has always been the motor in the, in the black people in the United States. We know the first permanent arrival of blacks, I mean, folks in West Africa was August 1619 to Virginia, my home state. From August 1619 to 2020 today, there's always been an economic impulse, a grassroots impulse, a grassroots economic impulse and political impulse. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of those people don't have access to cable news, don't have access to the major news. And a lot of us um, are only teaching part of what's happening there. So that's who I am, that's how I fit into it. Uh, I think what, what moves me is um, a certain understanding of black liberation theology against this USA. Um, black liberation theology has three terms in it, black liberation and theology. The foundational term, the cornerstone is liberation in the term, not black or theology. Liberation means that Jesus Christ, the historical Jesus, came to earth, and again, this is the story, we can interpret whether supernaturalism, but the thrust of it is what we take up. You know, I'm not gonna debate, I don't debate doctrine, and what did he walk on water? You know, I don't know, I wasn't there. <laughs> maybe he walked on water, maybe uh, You know, I know he may have turned water into wine, if you, all your Christians who know that story. <laughs> um, <laughs> I might believe that one. Um, yeah, definitely. So, <laughs> yeah, so we think that liberation is what that for us means that Jesus, the historical Jesus and the Jesus stories uh, show us two things. One, if we look at Luke chapter four, book of Luke chapter four, verses 16 and following, this is the only place in the 66 books of the Protestant Bible where Jesus says, this is the reason I came to earth. And in there, he says to free the poor, to help the prisoner, to help the widow, to help the workers, help the oppressed, to be liberated into the year of Jubilee. Okay, if the Jesus story says the primary reason I have come is for that, ah, black liberation theologians, at least the first generation from the 1960s, said, ah, okay. And then the other passage that a lot of them use, and I still use, is Matthew 25 and following. It's the parable of the story of the sheep and the goat. For a lot of us, again, of all in the 66 books of the Protestant Bible, that is the only place where Jesus says, this, these are the criteria to have new life. So, wow. If, you know, if somebody wants to have new life, don't have to be a Christian. And we find like, what are the criteria? The prisoner, visit the prisoner, food to the hungry, mm -hmm. liquid, um, thirst, water for the thirsty, housing, the poor, the widow, working people. The purpose of Jesus is that corresponds with the criteria for a new life or heaven, or I would say new life for yeah. people yeah. on earth. So what does that say? That says that, that is the motor for black liberation theology. So that's the liberation part of Jesus' message, particularly Luke chapter four, Matthew 25. The, black, the theology part says that that Jesus story of liberation it goes throughout the history of Christian tradition. So theology represents throughout the ages, theology is when we talk about how God relates to human, that's all theology is. Theos, theology, logos. That is logos is how we relate to theos. Mm -hmm. so, Theos Logos is how do human beings, since Jesus left wherever he went, mm -hmm. how do they debate and involve and live out the liberation message in the human realm? That's theology. So liberation, theology. Black is how all that reveals itself in black culture. That's what it says. How does that, how does the liberation message of Jesus reveal itself, express itself, understands itself in black culture and black life? Theology is how does uh, black how do black people in, the, in their own tradition relate it to this? So it's important for at least Black Theology Liberation USA to understand that liberation, the Jesus story of liberation of the poor, the working class, and the people who are materially suffering, they judge black culture. Black culture does not judge liberation. They judge theology. Black culture, theology doesn't. So that's very important because it, what we're, what we're, we're, at least the initial people and those of the second generation, maybe, we were struggling to create a new reality 
where black poor people could have a fullness of life, that they could participate in the resources of this earth, that we can you know, give, whether it's domestic violence resolution, to owning their own businesses, to providing education for their kids, to correcting you know, bad police activity. It was a comprehensive linking us to more to Africa, appreciating the global movements. It was all of that stuff, you know, having better preaching. I mean, it was a holistic, holistic, constructive uh, movement. The problem was that as people were developing the fullness or helped to develop the fullness of life of poor and working class black people, particularly urban areas, but there are black people in rural areas too. Uh, then you have is instances of white supremacy and racism blocking that. So it's important to say that it starts with a positive movement to fulfillness of life. It doesn't start with negativity. Historically, it didn't do that. Mm. That negativity got interrupted. Now the question then is, what's, what's the big debate? Start negative. Well, this has been a big debate in black theology since 1960s and 70s and early 80s. Is black liberation theology a reaction to white stuff? Or is black liberation theology an expression of the positive, energizing, spirit-filled, hopeful future of the Jesus story and black people? Two different things. Mm -hmm. And that's how, you know, it depends on how people, it depends on where people spend their energy. If depending on, if that was been, that's been debated in black liberation theology USA in the first generation, second generation. Mm -hmm. I was part of a second generation, <laughs> my little voice. Uh, but it's very important. What's important is that liberation is the guiding point in Black liberation theology, mm -hmm. not Black and not theology. And two, it begins as an affirmation of the good news that Jesus offers human beings, particularly Black people. Then the stuff, the negative stuff interrupts that. And then you got to fight. But it's not, I mean, I think a lot of people probably have never been organizers in the community. Uh, so I uh, five years in urban area in Harlem, old Harlem, and also since I've been in Chicago, I've been involved. I mean, a lot of people don't know it. I read all these books and blah, 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 talk, blah, blah, blah. But I, you know, quietly, I've been working with a group of, of black men on the South, the South side of Chicago. Is, I don't know what it is in Britain, but this would be, you know, I, now I'm older. I don't go there at nighttime. <laughs> uh, young guy did all kinds of things. But now we, and we, I've been working with some of those folks in the community for about 14 years or so. Mm -hmm. So these are the people who have to, they don't get up every day saying, okay, I need to get a gun to, it, it, these are people who say, well, I got to get my kids, they may think, can I get my kids safely to school? You know, where am I going to get food? These are, the, as a community organizer, rooted somewhere in a community with those people. That's how I see Black Liberation Theology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of stuff going on, right? Uh, so that's just sort of where I come from, family background, how I was introduced to Black Liberation Theology. And, yeah. but what, what has moved me as a community organizer, as an academic, as a global person, I, I created a 14 country network, uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America, Pacific Islands, USA, and England. Um, so I've done global stuff. Is that energy of the good news that poor and working class black people and poor working class all people in USA context mm -hmm. have the opportunity to have new life? You know, there's a better world for, for, for women who are struggling against domestic violence. You know, a lot of black churches do that. There's a better world for these young guys in Chicago every weekend who are shooting and killing each other. You know, that, that's the neighborhood reality. That's the neighborhood reality, you know, which is linked to the protests downtown, which you gotta have, a, you know, I'm, it's a holistic thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those are those people, those single, you know, I think something like 70% of black families are headed by black women out of wedlock. It's, it's just, you know, whatever the reality is, who's going to deal with that part of the black community? That's what black liberation tell. Who's going to deal with, um, you know, the trauma after this police brutality and somebody shot? There's trauma. It's intergenerational trauma. It's not just the headlights. Who's going to deal with that? This is the Jesus story that we're talking about. Now, of course, in the big, you know, fighting and all that, you know, there's cable news, there's all of that. And those, those are periodic, episodic. But uh, Black Liberation Theology is a grassroots movement that started um, by everyday people. There were no theologians in the first group of people who wrote the July 31st statement, 66. They were not professors. A lot, most of them didn't have PhDs. They were just pastors of churches. So that's how 
they had to deal with it. For my dissertation, I interviewed 15 black liber liberation theologians in South Africa under apartheid. You know, it was like a dictatorship when I was there. Mm. And I interviewed 15 black liberation theologians in the United States. And I interviewed the guys, and they were all guys, who, uh, who weren't the James Cones. These were the guys who preceded Cone, you know. And they were saying, well, as a pastor, you know, I had to take my car and put a black guy with Molotov cocktails in the trunk of my car. I guess you said the boot of the car, right, England? Yeah. And I had to drive it through the National Guard out of the ghetto. That was what my pastoral duty is. So you don't hear those stories unless you talk to the people who are not on cable news, you know? You, talk, you don't talk to Hopkins, you know? You have a whole series on the ghetto people, the black people, you can have, that's your next series. That, oh my God, the stories are so, the survival story and how they protest and how they under, undermine the system is incredible. And your story actually fits in, your personal story fits in well to that whole story of black theology coming out of grassroots because you are first and foremost, you know, before becoming a theologian, you were a community organizer. So you're already working in the grassroots. Exactly, precisely, precisely. I never, of course, we all can look 2020 in hindsight and frame it. But at the time, it was just a deep passion of service to people who were less off. And I get that uh, particularly, again, this is my story, particularly my father, my grandfathers, my great grandfathers. My father uh, lived to be 95. And, um, you know, young people used to come over to his house. He would sit on the front porch and they would ask, uh, this is in Virginia, rural village, Virginia, back on the, on the segregation. I was born legally on the segregation. I was born in St. Philip's Colored Hospital, downtown Richmond. And my birth certificate says colored seg segregation. Mm -hmm. um, and so they would come by and he would give them money. They would go to the store to get groceries for him. He didn't need any food, but he just wanted to help them. I remember, um, there was a, a boy in the neighborhood, his mother had left, so my father sent this, my two older sisters to go get him, and bring him in the house, give him a bath, clothes, feed him. And I was like, wow, this is deep. And there's six sons, I thought it was seven sons, but I found out later that the, guy, the seventh son who used to spend so much time in our house was a friend. He was adopted like that. So we always have this service, service to poor people, service for people who are less off than we are. Yeah. And thus, when I went to Harlem, you know, uh, looking back was a natural development. Uh, I had two older brothers uh, who were involved in the anti-Vietnam War and the other one was involved in the Black Power Movement. So he knew Stokely and all of that. So I grew up around that as well. Uh, then I had older brothers who had gone to, uh, right, they were in the Navy right after the Korean War. So again, my father was born in 1907, mother was born in 1914. So, and he died in 2002, he lived to be 95. So we have a whole historical suite that comes up into the current movement, and it it in, it brings the current movement in a in, in, in a history and a story and a tradition, and a future. We know that this moment is going to pass, but it is a massive movement. I have not seen anything like this since the uh, yeah. uh, today's movement, since the assassination of Martin Luther King. Yeah, wow. So, so something is happening. This is a major shift. We'll see how long it lasts or what the deep implications, but we won't know for 20 or 30 years from now. But something is happening in America and there are lots of people, not all, you know, there are 44 million African-American citizens in the United States. There are 360 U.S. citizens legally. There are 30 million other non, but, you know, so it doesn't represent everybody, but something is happening. And I have never, ever, since King, you know, I was in, I was in high school then, See anything like that? But it's 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 an exciting time. It's a dangerous time. It's a sober time, but it's a time of great opportunity. And it looks like a lot of younger folk are saying, you know, <laughs> we we're going to do our thing. You know, this we we are going to do our thing. So that's how I frame and, that. I mean, I, I guess linked to that, you know, we could ask one of these questions I've written down, which is, you know, I've put what what do you hope from this movement? Because what I'd like to ask you as well is is I guess linked to that as well. Why? Why do you think it has suddenly? Because black men have been killed by police, you know, intermittently for a while in the U.S. and even here have, have died in custody and things. Why has this suddenly, this moment, taken off? It's it's an amazing thing. It's an incredible thing. It's a tragic thing that so many people had to die before people kind of woke up and started actually caring. You know, 
but why is it sudden I guess the two questions are why is why do you think this is the special moment? why has it happened now why now and, yeah. and the other one is what what do you hope for because you're talking a lot about hope and how important that is to the Christian story and that actually we can't get only into protesting but the protesting must come out of that hope for some a, a better life and, and that um, mm -hmm. eternal life as as you interpreted it, this new life so if you can remember what my questions were so um so, so why <laughs> now and and and, um, and what do you hope for right i think that a lot of um people in the united states well let me tell you i think there are quite a number of african-american people in communities who um let me back up i think majority of people in the united states have never seen someone kill and die on camera mm -hmm. we've been a country that has been spared war unlike a lot of countries around the world you know we've been so Americans have been sort of an idealistic Hollywood notion, you know, in, in American movies, you can always tell the difference between American movies and Chinese movies, traditional Chinese movies. American movies, the good guy gets the girl, they tongue kiss and they ride off in the sunset at the end, you know. And, and the uh, Chinese movie, the, the, the hero dies. Right. When I first went to China, like 20 years, I was like, wait, the guy died? Don't he get the girl? Did he get off to do that? <laughs> <laughs> so all I'm saying is our Hollywood expresses American popular culture, novels, things like that, uh, that, uh, you know, things work out, you know, we've never been, we've never, so we, and we never had war. Um, the other thing too, there's a deep perception that the constitution works and bill of rights works and, you know, there's freedom of speech and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people were just uh, in American culture could not believe that someone was dying in front of them and he's being killed. The guy was murdered. Mr. George, I call him Mr. Mr. George Floyd was being murdered, you know, uh, in front of them. I think that shook a lot of people and said, you know, the, the bets is off. The bets are off. You know, the rules are we got to suspend the rules or we got to change the rules. or We got to reinterpret them, whatever one's political perspective, but something has to be done. A guy was killed. At, I don't know, you know, I guess the UK went through World War II and fascism, whatever, but the United States has been spared mm -hmm. above all of that, you know. We have civil discourse, you know, even though I have to, a lot of people have guns. But the idea of death, it I don't know how to express the words to people who aren't from the United States to see somebody killed, except for the guys and gals who went to war. Mm -hmm. You know, Vietnam, World War II, et cetera. They, but most American citizens, we were watching, the, we watched, we saw the guy die, he was killed. We saw a dead body. <laughs> and the hero didn't get up, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think part of it was just a, a, a visual and violent interruption of the American story, the American narrative, the American expectation, even its most brutal sense. And it was caught on live TV video that is gosh was it live i thought it was I'm a sorry it was not live it was uh i'm sorry <laughs> three-dimensional um yeah it was a full, supposed full to, long uh, video yeah a video right eight eight mm -hmm. i guess it was well it was much, if you, actually a lot of this is more than eight eight he was on his back they were actually three all together i don't know if you've seen the other angle there's an angle from the back so there was at least one other guy on his back as well so the first guy was on his neck the other guys so if there's another video from the back you can see them um it was a horrific brutal it disrupted what it mean to be human being it just at the fundamental primal level you just don't kill somebody you know and then the people who are taping says hey get out he can't breathe you get all of this and it's just oh it's sad it breaks my heart you know it um you know he his mother my understanding his mother died like three years ago but I don't, have you heard the video? He says, mama. So if, you, if this is true, his mother died three years ago. What is, you know, so this happens when he see, when people see death coming and we experience that. The guy is calling for his mama and she died three years ago, that. Yeah. And he said, somebody tell my children I love them. And it's like, what is going on? Oh, he, he dies and his tongue is hanging out. Oh. Yeah, this is for, the, particularly from the US context, we have never, we've seen it in Hollywood, but we have never seen anything like this. And I think a lot of people said, this is the straw that broke the camel's back. This is it. And so people who had all kinds of grievances, whether it was the police 
uh, instances of police brutality or whether it's housing or whether it's curriculum in the schools or whether statues or whether everything just erupted like a volcano. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and then the Black Lives, so again, Black Lives Movement as an organization, because we can talk about differentiating what is Black Lives Matter. In the US context, it's different levels. Mm -hmm. Globally, they be framed one way. But if we say there's the, the organization, Black Lives Matter International Foundation, which was formed by three black women on the West Coast, they had set up an apparatus under the Obama administration a lot of people don't want to talk about it, but a lot of the black, the killing of black men was under eight years of the Obama administration. The Black Lives Movement did not, wasn't founded under the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. It was founded the Obama administration. I just think that's, I just like to look at everything. It's tragic, I'm, isn't it, really? I'm not running for office, so I don't worry about votes. You know? um, so anyway, so, so the other thing was there was an apparatus. There was a structure. There was an awesome name, Black Lives Matter, pithy, catchy. So they had, a nice, they had a nice logo and all of that slogan, and they had an organization, infrastructure, and that was able to um, name and frame and help organize a movement that erupted like a volcano. That um, and then too, you have to also talk about the President of the United States, uh, you know, President uh, Donald Trump, for those who hate Trump, those who support Biden, and those who were looking for a, a convenient target, then you also had, for historical reason, there's a president of the United States that can also focus it for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, wouldn't been able to do that if, if it was Obama was president, it would be difficult to focus it because the people said, well, you can't, he's a black person. But I think too, so history, history had pulled together a lot of factors from the yeah. White House to seeing somebody die and murdered on video to an apparatus that was intact to a really pithy slogan, Black Lives Matter. You know, it's just, and also the fact that the founders were three black women. Mm -hmm. And I know one is, uh, is self-identified as a lesbian sister. So you've got that dimension of multiplicity, intersectionality and women and all this stuff, I think just came together. It never came together like that in the history of yeah. the United States. It was not like that in King in 68 when he's assassinated. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not like that in the 1920s and 30s uh, with the Harlem Renaissance and also a lot of people want to talk about the Communist Party of CP, Communist Party of USA led a lot of black sh struggles in the 30s. Um, you know, so you can go on. I mean, well, I'm not into communism personally, but just looking at the history of movements and how they compare to the factors that came together today. Mm -hmm. My humble opinion, I have never seen so many factors mm -hmm. come together. You know, history will judge the movement. You know, we're in quite in the mix of it, you know. It's, and uh, the revolutionary spirit or counter-revolution. The other thing is, you have to remember, I, <laughs> one, I follow the liberation of the Jesus story. <laughs> okay, that's where I go. I love Black Americans. So that's, and the other thing too is I'm concerned about the people on the ground. So when I see a statue pulled down, my question is, okay, how is that helping the, that Black woman who's got three kids on the South Side of Chicago that I knew, you know, like that. So that's just to put it out there. That's my energy is that. And um, so, you know, there's, there are a lot of things going on today, but those are some of the factors, I think. Uh, I'm hopeful that um, when all is said and done, that the billions of money that's being given to the overall Black Lives Movement will trickle down to those people. You may not, you, for example, Wall Street companies, Silicon, Silicon Valley companies, uh, high net worth individuals, uh, corporations, foundations have given three billion, would it be, to the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter, BLM. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's something it, that was small before, actually. You know, yeah. Well, and my thing is like, hey, whatever happens, you know, hopefully it'll get to those people that, that I that I think the, the Black Black Liberation Theology is about. That's all. I'm not. I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a really optimist. I always believe the glass is half full. I'm, you know, I don't spend a lot of energy <laughs> on evil. I spend a lot of energy on hope and building. Maybe because I was a community organizer, my father was like that, my mother was like so. Um, I just hope that some of that $3 billion gets to infrastructure. We have food deserts, you know. We would have to sometimes, you know, go to the store for some of these old retired black women on, you know, in, in, the, in the urban areas. They can't get there. They don't have cars, right? Wow. Um, or they were afraid to come out of the house. Okay. Uh, so can we get some Uber over there? Can we build some supermarkets? Can we, 
Can we take some of these youth on vacations with the $3 billion? Can we get scholarships for, for kids? Can we help those mothers? Can we have professionals come in and deal with domestic violence? You know, um, which is intensified given the shutdown with the you know, COVID-19. These are the issues of those people in the community that I'm concerned about. You know, let's get part of the $3 billion to those. What about Mr. George Floyd's family? See, this is the other thing. I want to focus on the family. Take care of them. Fortunately, I have some of the NBA players have given like a hundred million. I mean, they get they really take care of his kids. But, but I still want, I'm still concerned about that. You know, the intergenerational trauma. His daughter. I'm more into that. You know, how are we going to deal? Then her friends. You know, are, what's happening there? They're lo- they're not in the headlines anymore. You know, what kind of maybe I'm too much of a I don't know. Maybe my old buddy did or young. So I, I I'm thinking about that. Get some of that. I want to know where I want to trace that three billion to the south side of Chicago. And then how do we use that part of the bill to restructure or inform the police community relationships, you know, like that, all that types of things, housing. Um, so some of us are actually still quiet as it's kept working on some housing projects and, uh, you know, some things now we are probably, I don't want to condemn it by talking about it prematurely, but that's some folk are still concerned about that, you know. Uh, so I'm hopeful that the people who are everyday people uh, we'll have a better life. And again, this hope is rooted in a hist- history. Uh, if we look at the movements in the United States, it has been the everyday people who powered those movements. And Dr. King was brilliant. He always recognized those people. You know, he said a pilot always has a ground crew. You know, so he, he always recognized that he was not interested in being in the limelight. He never made any money. In fact, he and Coretta Scott King used to argue his wife. Um, so it's the, it's the ground crew that powers history. <clears throat> yeah. I studied the liberation movements, decolonial movements in, in throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and particularly the whole continent of Africa in the 60s. When you read all those books of Kenneth Kaunda, the first prime minister, uh, uh, the old, you know, Nelson Mandela when he was in jail, the books he wrote, uh, Julius Nyeri, uh, Tanzania, the first prime minister, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, I can go on and on. They all started with the vision, vision of what they call a new humanity. We would say new They started with what the new humanity would be. And they linked that to the rural peasants and the urban, and then the professionals like that. So I really learned from people who actually made revolution, who actually built countries. And it resonated deeply with me. And I've always carried that with me uh, in my heart when I look at what's happening today. So I'm hopeful about the poor people, the working people, black folk, they power history and they will ultimately triumph in building this new community. Uh, it's gonna be very painful. Everything is painful, right? Anything that's worth it is gonna be painful. Um, but it seems to me that would be the best, one of the best testimonies to the senseless, brutal elimination of, of Mr. George Floyd. Mm-hmm. If on that, you know, like the Phoenix, the Phoenix arise out of ashes, if working people on the south sides of Chicago, you know, those, and I use it as a symbol, uh, if they have a if they have a better life, if the blood of Mr. George Floyd could could you know water the soil, that new lives that come from poor and working class black people, I would be very, I'm very very hopeful for that. And I don't to me it's intergenerational. It's not just a it's intergenerational. But what we do now impacts you know you know there's a whole big elections coming. Mm-hmm. And when you talk about this intergenerational trauma. And mm-hmm. you started at the beginning as well about talking about your family. And I think you said that your great great grandfather or your great 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 grandfather was in slavery, I think you said. Anyway, it just brings it home. People think it's ages ago. It's not ages ago. It's late nineteenth century, you know. Mm-hmm. You're talking eighteen sixties still with slavery. I mean, it's it's, it's mm-hmm. madness, really, that it's so close. People feel like the the Second World War is close, but that's not even that much later. <laughs> people, people have this intergenerational trauma from the things that are happening now, but also from probably from historical things, you know, that, that have happened. Absolutely, absolutely. That was just yeah. a statement rather than a question. <laughs> no, I think it's important because it's not, that's why I want to frame the current movement, at least in the US context, in, in a generational framing that goes back to 1619. So our story is there, <clears throat> quiet as it's kept. The first group of enslaved Africans brought to the so-called new world 
was in Florida. They were Catholics brought them and they were Spanish speaking, but they didn't, the colony didn't last. So Roman, Black Roman Catholic liberation would always correct us properly. So after the framework, it was 1619 for Herman. And they have, so yeah, we're, we're, we're thinking about that. Now, that is why um, quite a number of Black people today in the United States keep referring to slavery. Now, whether it's right or wrong, you know, people say, well, you know, I didn't sell. That's because it's just, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a recent memory. Like I said, it would be my, my um, it's my great grandparents, not great great. Okay. I was quite sure that, but yeah. Yeah, my father's I just want to add years to you. Hey, <laughs> Dado, <laughs> <that> oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> they have a saying in a lot of the black churches is that, you know, everybody want to go to heaven and see Jesus. And then my father, who loved the church, and others with the old, they were people who had a good sense of humor, who loved Jesus. They would say, yeah, everybody talking about heaven, but they're not ready to go right now. So I'm talking about the Jesus story, but I'm not ready to go meet him right now. So not that <laughs> um, Yeah, so that's, I think you wrote a brilliant point about the intergenerational trauma, because for a lot of Black folks, um, it's, it is, it's in the family. Like my great grandparents, not my great, great, but great, great, but you know, uh, yeah. And you, we grew up with these stories, you know, I can tell you, but what if, you know, how you mail, how do you ride a horse, you know, how do they skin a pig, and you know, I got all these graduate degrees, and you know, I can tell you, you know, uh, you know, how people got married, I can tell you, how do you make do hoodoo and voodoo to, <laughs> to get a man to love you, I can tell you, <laughs> you know, what type of, I, actually, right, I, actually, my father knew all this, my mother too, but, but no, it's, it's, it's part of the stories that we, we don't learn. We didn't learn in school. We yeah. learn them at home. We learn them at Christmas. We learn July Fourth gatherings. We learn them at Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. church revivals, back in the day. Some of it's still around, but you know everything changed. And I'm not people say, "Oh, Professor Hopkins, you write about the '60s." First of all, I don't want to go back. I'm not that type of. Well, you know, the we were much better in the '60s. No, I think every generation of Black people, all young people, have the right to determine their own destiny. And any old gray haired try to tell them to go back. This, this is a Christian story, right? So I better watch my language. Uh, <laughs> they should just say, leave me alone and let us do our thing. So that's my first, that's why I love, that's why I love education. Because young people are fired up and ready to go. And my role is to, if there is a role, it's really a facilitator to help people claim their own voice and to create their own story, recognizing previous stories. That's why I stay, I love teaching. I haven't retired, I don't plan to, because I just enjoy seeing young people do that. You know, it's just, it's amazing, you know. That's the future, that's the hope with the young. We can't, we can't keep holding on and, you know, it used to be this way or don't do this. Uh, I just enjoy people, young folks in motion, and that's what's going on today. Mm -hmm. I used to work with students in the university as well, so. I can definitely appreciate the, the energy and, you know, the, the need for change that they have, this urgent need for change and that things are not right. So that's, you know, it's very, it's very much things to learn from younger people as much as there are things to learn from older people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, could you, Professor, um, or, or Dwight, as you prefer, um, could you tell us a little bit about your books and which, maybe, maybe just give us a, an idea of which ones you think people could start with if they wanted to read some of them? Because Anthony tells me you've written quite a few. <laughs> so where do we start? <laughs> the master of hyperbole. Um, <laughs> uh, there are two books I would recommend, and they're actually written for a mass audience beyond the academy. One is called Black Theology, Essays on Gender Perspectives. The second one is called Black Theology, Essays on Global Perspectives. So they have the same name, except for one is, has gender and one has global. And it, it, it's a review of all my thinking and development on gender and on globalization. Uh, so some are articles, a couple are speeches I gave. So it's much more geared toward uh, a non-academic, non-specialized audience like that. And, in, and I write an introduction in both, which tells for the first time my own family story. So you'll, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. He knows how to, hunt. he knows how to shoot a deer. Okay. <laughs> Professor Hopkins, so I talk a little bit about, you know, my father and my family. 
stuff like that. So get a little, little taste of the, the full me in there and the introductions as well. Great, brilliant, thank you. That's really helpful. Because I think it's always, it's always good for people to start somewhere that's, you know, and then discover more. That somewhere that's slightly more accessible and they can pursue it further. Yeah. Um, you know how much white folk like to feel like we're doing something by joining a book club, you know? <laughs> There's that old joke, isn't it? It's quite <laughs> lovely, isn't it? <laughs> uh, no, it, reading is important, you know, you yeah, can change yeah. the lives. It's just, uh, at some point, uh, you know, philosophers have interpreted the world, sometimes we have to also change it. So, but reading is very important. Uh, look, you know, mm -hmm. duh, obviously it's important in my yeah. life. Well, educating ourselves is important. And then, and then of course, doing the grassroots stuff as well, you know. It's mm -hmm. that feeding in, isn't it? It's that liberation theology cycle, isn't it, of learning and from what you experience and experiencing and then it feeds into your learning, etc. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly it's very you can come be my co-teacher. That's exactly <laughs> you did my whole 10 weeks in 30 seconds. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's, that's oh, I've that. done a bit of liberation theology. I think it's it's re really inspiring stuff. So um, oh. and it's fed into so many different different branches now. You know, it, when sometimes when you speak speak of just liberation theology on its own, you think of kind of South American kind of Gustavo Gutierrez and this uh -huh. kind of thing, and and it's kind of focused on, on poverty and liberation of the poor. But then it's become well, maybe it's not become. Maybe that's me doing wrong history. Actually, I feel like theology actually goes back further actually, but has kind of got drawn into the liberation theology thing that came out of the 60s, 70s that had got labelled that, I think, and black theology kind of got, was already probably a thing, and it, it got kind of amalgamated into it, maybe. But there's yeah, feminist kind of theology, I, I, queer theology, you know, you've got all these different branches now, haven't you? So Yeah, no, it's awesome, right. Now, I do, so, so just to clarify, <clears throat> so um, Gustavo Gutierrez's first Spanish edition of his book, A Theology of Liberation, hmm was published in 1971. That was okay. the first book mm -hmm. in Latin America. Then the English translation was Orbis Books, 1973. Okay, so just, but what's important for us to realize is that liberation theology arose simultaneously all over the world from Sri Lanka to South Korea to United States, all over the world. What's happened is that there were in the, there was a generation ahead of me, uh, particularly a couple of white scholars, who whose mission was to link to equate liberation theology with Latin America. Mm -hmm. It never liberation theology for Latin America never historically was equa they were equated. A uh, couple of reasons. What's, how can I say that? First of all, when we read Gustavo Gutierrez's um, book, and I was just on a Zoom with him last week, actually, mm -hmm. he's still he's a driver. Mm -hmm. And we've done panels together before. Mm -hmm. um, he says, I'm developing a liberation theology for the Latin American context. So the father in that region says in his text. So that's one. Mm -hmm. Two, liberation theology, there are books on liberation theology that preceded Gutierrez's book. And it's not to compete, but James Cone's first book was March of 69. Chapter two of the book says liberation theology. Okay. <laughs> his second book, 1970, again, one year before Gustavo Gutierrez's book, is, is it a Black Theology of Liberation. That's the title of the book. <laughs> so then, and then there's a third book on Black political theology that J. D. Otis Roberts, who was also a first generation Black past liberation academic, his came out, and then Gustavo's came out the next year. So mm -hmm. the Black church was publishing on liberation theology. So that's the USA. I can go down to, I can go, I mean, I teach this. <laughs> Sri Lanka, 1967, 66. South Korea, you can go on and on. South Africa, oh. You know, I can go on, I teach this stuff, you know, I've traveled. <laughs> um, so it was just, a, and I think, and, and first of all, when I was younger, I used to really get excited about it because folk were saying that, that people in Asia couldn't do liberation theology. The people in South Africa, and it was only, but again, it was, to my understanding, it was more North, I, actually, I, he was a friend of mine. I should, I don't want, he's dead now. It was a white theologian who wrote lots of books. He wanted to make liberation theology Latin America. 
So there's a movement in the United States to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main thing is to realize that um, the spirit of liberation of Black, it can't be housed, it can't be contained in one region. It can't be contained in Black liberation theology in the United States because we've got queer, we've got just, you know, ableism. It can't be contained. Mm -hmm. So too, globally, it can't be contained to Latin America. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing I want to share too is that the first generation of, of liberation theologians globally created an international organization called ETWA, is the acronym. Economic, uh, Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians. And that's when all the first generation, James Cohn was in it, Gustavo Gutierrez is in it, Gusto Gonzalez was in it, the Boff brothers were in there, Balasuria from Sri Lanka, uh, Simon Mamela from, uh, from Pretoria, South Africa. I mean, all these people I interviewed when I was a little shorty, because I like to go talk to real people before they die. Mm -hmm. They were all in, all in it. And they debated. In fact, the organization was created by a black priest from Africa. That's the other thing people don't realize. So the first global international liberation theology network, which was the house for the global development, was initiated by an African. You know, and then I, as I, when I, and so I was always a young person being pulled into stuff. So after I graduated, I they they let me in. <laughs> Why did they be? And I was the chair of the International, the International Theological Commission where all the theology was, the, that's, that's the heartbeat, right? I was head of the committee, we produced a book, you know, I edited the book. So I just want to clarify that, you know, it, it just, liberation theology arose everywhere in the world. Yeah. One of the beautiful things that the thinkers and pastors and priests and policymakers in Latin America have done is that they are focused on publishing. And I just so, respect and I'm impressed by how they have continually, I just sat on a dissertation um, committee of a student at the University of Chicago, uh, brilliant, he's like a fourth generation and um, they're still publishing. So I think part of it too is that they have claimed their voice in that region and they're gonna publish it. And so when one a person or a group of folks claim their voice and publish, then it, people think that that is the only way. But I think you, you introduced a very common, I don't know if you were, I'm sure you were aware of it. Yeah, it has, it has manifested in all kinds of ways. I mean, what you just said, right? It has manifested. Yeah. A good example is when I was at Union Theological Seminary and I started there in the MDiv program in 1981 and graduated the PhD in 1988. Um, we had pioneers in Black liberation theology. We had, okay, so we had four African-American men on the faculty, one African-American woman on the faculty, you know, half the, popular, half the, half the faculty were white women, um, we had the founder of Black Liberation Theology on the faculty. We had the founder of Black Theology and Marxism on the faculty, Cornell West. We had the founder of Black Church Studies on the faculty, James McCall. We had one of the founders of Womanist Theology she was on the faculty. We had the founder of Mujerista, which is Latin. Mm -hmm. is Latin America. These, and we had the founder of some of the first and most brilliant, le their self-identification, lesbian theologians, Bev Harrison, and um, Phyllis Tribble, Text of Terror. Yeah, yeah, this is what I went with in 1981. So wow. liberation theology was just all around Union Seminary. And it, it was just, and it was organically bubbling. So for a lot of us, particularly those who were, who at that time was going on on the limb, who, uh, you know, we openly came out in support of, uh, we, our term would be gay and lesbian back in, this was 1979. You know, a lot of us were laughed out. You know, it was like, man, what are you talking about? You know, that's a white man's thing. That's from Europe. You know, that's a white feminist. And we was like, no, man, we, gotta, we said liberation is the narrative. We got to be consistent. We can't just keep it to black people. You know, everybody has to have fullness of life. I'm hetero, for example, I'm African-American. I'm American citizen. I'm married kids. You know, <laughs> might be having a grandkid, kind of hoping that. But anyway, <laughs> I love who I am. You know, I'm from the South. I love my father. You know, I, have, I love my father. My, Okay, I can love myself and also allow people to be there for, you know, it doesn't have to be either or, you know. Mm -hmm. And so for some of us, particularly, you know, the second generation, who for us it would have been early, maybe in, in the UK, it came, you know, people accepted it earlier than we did, but for a lot, that was. Um, Not so much in the 80s, though. <laughs> yeah, well, this was 79, and then I moved it. So, we, so as a community organizer, um, began to see some black folk who were also gay and lesbian on the ground, right? Then they said, well, that's the reality. And then formally went in the academy in 81. But you know, liberation theology was manifested all kinds of ways at Union did. It was just an amazing, and we had 
people come from all over Asia, Africa, Latin America to, to teach for a year. So um, again, that's when I was talking at the beginning that in black liberation theology, the key for me and a lot of us was the liberation part. Mm -hmm. And that's important because the liberation is the, is the way we self critique our, the movement, our movements, I'll make it personal. So when we were organizing in Harlem for five years and when we were doing quiet as it's kept some things on the south side of Chicago for 14 years or so, what is it that critiques us? You know, what is it that keeps us honest and accountable? You know, what is it that helps deal with our own internal psychological and emotional and, se and sexual demons that we have, that we are, I have? It has to be the narrative of the liberation in community. That to me enlivens the black part. You know, if there's no self critique inside of the movement today, I think there is. And I think part of it now is a little covered over because pretty much a lot of the movement is trying to get President Trump out of office. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not, at this point in my life, I don't really, <laughs> it is. So whether it's good or bad, history will judge it. So, uh, so a lot of self-critique, I think, has been pushed back until November 3rd, and maybe there'll be more discussion and conferences. Mm -hmm. And from some political scientists and public leaders' perspective, they think that's imp you know, it's important to postpone it. So anyway, whether it's postponed now or come out five years later, I just think that the, uh, the beauty and the hope of this good news that is liberation is that it tells poor people, it tells working class people, it tells people another world is possible. That's the, that's the fundamental thing. You know, that's why there's so much, that's why they call it good news. Hello, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, you start dancing, whatever you, you want to do, or just read a book, it doesn't matter. If that's the good news. And another world's possible. And I'm concerned about whether that mess, how we get that message materialized, institutionalized, and structures, material structures on earth. Because whether it's domestic violence, the things we don't want to talk about, right? Or whether it's cancer, or whether it's obesity, or whether it's police brutality, or whether it's homelessness, job, you know, whatever. I have to force to go to the military, whatever the structures of the, we've got to say, look, we have got to take care of the people who don't have the resources in their lives. Some folks says it needs to be reparations. Some folks feels that, you know, you need to have more fathers in the house. I mean, See, to me, I'm not I'm running for office. Okay? I'm concerned about those communities because that's usually the debate, right? Well, if you think that there needs to be more fathers in the house, then you support Trump. If you think that there needs to be uh, uh, more reparations to support Biden, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm just, those people will come and go. You know, I got here when Dwight Eisenhower was the president. Okay, so I, 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 we thought Watergate, we thought fascism was coming with Richard Nixon. People thought fascism was coming. I was there. I mean, I was never a big leader, but I was around. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, Vietnam, you know, Nepal. Then, you know, um, Bush won, Reagan, you know, people who, were, and then of course, people who think the other way thought that, uh, thought Muslims were taking over the country when Obama was uh, president. So I've been, you know, we've been, and this too shall pass. But what's hopeful for me, again, is that young people are moving now in this moment. So I'm concerned about how do we link the, 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 the joy and the beauty and the effervescence. That's the part of life that young energy bring. You know, they really take risk and have yeah. with sort of the sober long-term vision so they will see the vision beyond the moment. And mm -hmm. I'm, I work in those spheres. I get paid my day job to do that in the classroom. And then my other stuff I do is outside the classroom. That's what the nexus I'm working on. And... Um, I think it's, it's amazing. Again, I've never seen anything like this. There were 320 cities that went on fire after King was assassinated in America. April 4th, 1968, in a Church of God in, uh, at, 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 in Memphis, Tennessee, is when King was assassinated, mm -hmm. April 4th, 68. And that summer of 68, it was about 320 American cities burning, you know. And it was like, oh my God, it's the apocalypse. And people saying, you know, it's revolution. There was a lot of cement what they, because a lot of people say, okay, they, they killed, they, they'll say, well, they killed Malcolm X, so he was, you know, but they killed the peace, the drum major of peace. That's why people just went crazy. Mm -hmm. And I have never experienced anything like this, except for when Mr. George Floyd was killed today, and people are still in motion. Um, 
I think we need a combination of both uh, public voices and also behind the scenes structural voices. They have to go together. Uh, and again, I, I, I think a lot of it today, this is my humble opinion, <laughs> Is uh, it's it's going towards the re-election of uh, to re-election. It's going toward the election of. Uh, oh, I hope that wasn't a slip. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, no, it's uh, no. Oh, the the Black Lives Matter. Oh no, no, they're not going to. No, they're they're. Uh, in fact, that's that was one of the statements that one of the leaders said in an interview. She said, "Yeah, she said the Black Lives Matter movement is just is set to is is in motion to to elect uh, Joe Biden." I said, "That's a very." Again, I'm not running for office, so I'm not left, right. But it seems to me that, okay, if that's the movement leaders, and this movement is huge, as you well know, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do we take that and link it again to those the south sides of Chicago? That's what I, yeah. uh, and some people have said, well, you know, defund the police. Others have said that make up zones, you know, free zones of the people. And I'm using a gentle description. Um, then okay, if that's the program, then how again, how does what impact does it have on those local communities? That's the thing. Does it empower them? Does it not? Mm -hmm. I'm not in those local zones in Portland and Seattle. I'm not part of the leadership of Black Lives Matter. I'm not part of the local leadership. Uh, so I don't know the inside workings, you know, because cable news is always going to portray left, right, and center exaggerated, because that's what media does, except for independent media like your series, of course. <laughs> But the larger mainstream media, that's what they get paid for. It's in, hey, well, that's their job. I get paid to teach. Uh, but yeah. I'm always concerned about the media, like your media, that level of media, or I'm concerned about what's, what's happening in the neighborhood clubs. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand, uh, you know, what's happening in those, the so-called gangs of these black youths from age, age 10, mm -hmm. eight, nine, and 10. You know, in Chicago, I know. That's another thing we don't want to talk about. We got to also talk about the violence you know, every weekend in Chicago, we have shooting. I've been here like 25 years. This thing just started. It's from Friday to Monday. We have shootings. You know, and again, my criteria is the liberation story and those families. Mm -hmm. Those women who are singers, like 70% or something. Uh, it's like, it's probably from about every weekend, 12 to 65 people shot every weekend. And then maybe, you know, two to seven killed, you know. Uh, I don't want that. That's, so my heart is for, so those are children who are being shot. Mm -hmm. Those are sons, those are daughters, you know, sisters and brothers. So I'm not for violence. I definitely don't support this weekend killing within the black community, because I see that it's impacting their lives. You know, these folks would be going to university or they could have imagined a new discovery for how to cure cancer or how to bring supermarkets to the community, how to help their grandparents, you know, so I'm not into attacking them all, you know, these gang bangers, you know, I'm not into that. My children, I'm not into it. You know, nine generations of Hopkins family, we, that's not our thing. We don't roll like that, right? But still, I have deep sympathy because I see human beings who have the possibility to benefit from the liberation struggle, the liberation story of Jesus. I know the world's possible. Mm -hmm. So at some point, maybe after uh, November 3rd, depending on who becomes president, um, the, the movement, the leaders of this movement, effervescent movement, there's some excesses, but every movement has excesses. Maybe we can also attend to that more too. Uh, use some of that three billion USD dollars for that. Use some of this awesome access to global publicity and there's a national global movement. I still want to help those folks. You know, I don't want those 65 people shot. That is a lot, you know. On a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> every weekend in Chicago. And we could go on and on. I don't want to speak about other people's. And I'm not blaming, I am not blaming the mayors or the police. So let me just be very clear for people who have been, it's not, I'm more concerned, what are we going to do it? Okay, we can, whether you vote left, right, or center, and that's, you know, it's a right of every human being to express their voice anywhere. That's my humble thing. Um, but I'm saying, what, what's the program for them? Is, is that normal? <laughs> Maybe I'm crazy or something, you know, but it happens every weekend. And now, for whatever reason, it's happening in the weekdays. You know, like on Monday in the daytime, I think it was maybe like 15 or something in Chicago was shot. It usually ended around Monday morning, like midnight, you know, or 1 a.m. 
So something is, you know, maybe it's the excess of the times and it'll, it'll play itself up. But my heart is touched by that. Mm, it's probably you know, that, a lot of factors, isn't it? Poverty included, you know, and, and yeah. lack of hope. Hope is an important thing. A lot of people maybe, you know, in, in poorer communities just lack hope for their lives, you know. And it is yeah. how you end up in, in this kind of gangs and things. Yeah. But I have to say, too, that there are some churches, there are some women's groups, and there are some mother's groups, uh, and, and I don't know it's outside of Chicago. I don't want to name them because, first of all, I won't get the names right, and I don't want to leave anybody out. But to your point, your brilliant point about the hope piece, there's hope. It's just the cable news, they're doing their thing. Their thing is to get the rate in the United States context. Their mm -hmm. goal is to get paid. It's a capitalist society. Where you do that is get the ratings up. The way you get the ratings up is, is sensationalism because it grabs the heartstrings. You want to follow the story like a soap opera every week. That's the purpose of cable. Cable news in the United States, majority, not all, is not to tell the news. That's not the purpose of, of the cable news. Um, so they're doing their thing. Hey, right on to you, as we used to say in the 60s, power to your sister. Mm -hmm. But there are also these folks on the ground, the south sides of Chicago, who are hopeful, to your point about hope, mm -hmm. that they'll get the cable news. There are people who are organizing homeschooling for black kids, you know, because of shutdown. There are people who are still doing Boy Scouts. There's people who are trying to reach out and provide community development. Some of these the so-called gangbangers, which is not it. They're little, little shorties who are form. In fact, there were interviews of them when we were doing it. I, you guess I'm older. I don't do it anymore. You know what they said? Some of these guys, and it wasn't all the black men young in Chicago, but they were saying, well, look, all y'all black professors, y'all moved out. You, he's like, he said, hey man, Press Hopkins, you you are, you are University of Chicago with Obama. You out there with the white people. This is how they talk, not on cable. And you left, y'all all gone. We, you're not there. We don't have any jobs. School is boring. Police always pulling us over. So we think we're gonna do it. Only family, so this is, I don't support it. I don't support gangs or any type of thing. So I'm just, we're trying to understand who are these human beings you know, who walk this earth and for whatever reason feel a, a, an appropriate uh, outlet is to come together and start shooting everybody, you know? Mm -hmm. um, to me, that story too has to go along with the police issues because um, I'm not interested in someone coming into anybody's community and shooting and killing them. And I'm not interested in innocent people inside of the community being killed, you know? And yeah. it, it really, you know, I have a passion for young people, as you, as you know. I just can't, I just see human beings dying. I see young people kill, yeah, I just, and we have to, we have to intervene and we have to intervene somehow. You need the holistic approach, doesn't it? To, to these kind of, yeah. you know, it's not a, just the, the police, although it would be wonderful to, to sort a lot of those police problems out and, and, and the greater kind of racism in society. Like, yeah. yeah. Ends all those police issues. Yeah. And I think that the larger picture that you're, you know, portraying, you know, is, there are movements and mechanism in place to deal with that. That's what we're seeing, you know? And it's obviously debate, do you defund, do you redirect, or do you have citizens patrols, or do you have citizens police patrols? Do you have take the guns away? Let, all that's being discussed. So that, I, that's being discussed and it's being sorted out. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to figure out how to also bring other parts of the picture into the story. Mm -hmm. That's all like that. No, it's important to think holistically, I think, isn't it, about people's lives. Like you said, it's about people, in the end, it's about people's lives, isn't it? It's not about, it's not even about just the economy as a, a kind of vague concept, like a lot of people talk. It, 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 even when you're talking about things like the economy or whatever, you're talking about people's lives and how, you know, that's the first and foremost thing. I think it's actually, I, I love the way you talked about those two passages. Um, was it Matthew? Jesus about his own mission um, uh, and I, I, I was talking last week to Anthony about this ridiculous theologian <laughs> I shouldn't I shouldn't be disrespectful but very conservative theologian who is white um, in the UK and he kind of tweets these kind of awful views about liberation theology and kind of just dismisses everything um, as kind of identity politics and whatnot and, and yet what, what you've said is the, shows the exact opposite for me. It shows that actually it's the absolute heart of the gospel, liberation theology. It is theology, you know, and that's why it didn't come out of Gustavo Gutierrez. It didn't come out of one place. It came out of so many different places because it's 
G it's the gospel. Of course it did, because it's that's the that is the story. That's our story. So, you know, for somebody to kind of dismiss that as if they've got some kind of pure um theology over here when actually it's just a white man theology, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know? May, may I ask, you know, you don't have to give me the name, but may I ask what is his what is his alternative? Well, I think he thinks that there's some kind of um, objective theology that we should all be doing or something. Oh, um, that, that, his name is John Milbank. You can know his name. He, he, he's, he's a professor. I think he's a professor or a doctor. Anyway, he's a, tu he's a tutor at a university, but he's very, and he's a theologian, but he's, he's got become more and more extreme in his kind of things he's, he's saying, basically, and upsetting a lot of people. And yeah, dismissing everything that is liberation theology. Um, and it's, it's, it's upset a lot of people um, that are doing great work because they care about people, you know. Liberation theology is about people, isn't it? It's yeah. about caring about people's lives. And so. I'll have to, uh, yeah. That's, I, <laughs> I won't comment since it's in the UK. But. You, you can see it's wound me slightly up, can't you? <laughs> uh, I think we better, we better end there. But, um, I didn't have that many more questions anyway, and, and I think you answered pretty much all of them anyway in, in, in what you've answered when I've asked you the other questions. But I, I feel like maybe we should wrap it up because I don't, I want people to listen to the whole of this interview and, and, and not kind of go, oh, it's, it's long. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up here. But it was really, really lovely to speak to you. And thank you so much for coming um, on um, to Zoom. There we go, product placement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for inviting us. Chicago. Yeah, it's, it's been a thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And uh, also thank you again to Anthony Reddy uh, for the work he's done and really appreciate what he and the other colleagues are doing there. Um, and I know he understands, at least he's refer related to me, that he might be the, you know, the pilot of the ship, but there's a heck of a lot of ground crew in, in your context that, that, are on the, that are working hard. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dwight. Thank you. Okay, take care. Okay.